Father, we trust that as we come here, we are not trying to grasp something out of the heavens, that we are not trying to take something that is not ours to have, that we are not stretching beyond our limits, but that you have come down in your Holy Spirit, in your Son, Jesus, and made yourself known to us. I pray that by your word, you would open our ears to receive what you have for us today, that these would not just be my words, but that it would be your word, meeting your people and making us all, myself included, new. It's in Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, for joining us in worship today. Thank you so much for those uh, who are joining us from at home today. We are so thankful um, that you're here. Um, as we get into the sermon, I, I actually want to start today a little bit in the deep end. Because I tried to, as I tried to think of how to introduce this sermon with, a, with a, like a story or an illustration, it just kept feeling kind of flippant. And, and the wrestling here is too massive. The, the invitation that is offered is too significant. So... Here's the question I want to start by asking us today. What is the biggest problem that you are facing? What is the problem that's keeping you awake at night? That when you wake up early in the morning, it's nagging at you and not letting you go back to sleep. What's that problem that's the source of your most fervent prayers, even if that prayer is just simply help, help, help over and over again? What, what is the part of life that you most long for, most ache for healing? Now, I want you to hold that in your heart and mind as I ask you another question and know that I ask it in all pastoral gentle, gentleness and, and tenderness. What if you're wrong? What if that is not actually your greatest problem? What if the healing Jesus wants to offer is actually in another area, in another place? Would you have faith to receive that? Or would you demand something else? Today, we come to that question in chapter 9 of Matthew's Gospel. I encourage you, if you have a copy of the Scriptures, to turn there with me. I want you to be assured that this comes from God's Word and it's not just my words. In this season of Epiphany, we're, we're asking the Father to illumine for us who Jesus is, what he's about. So we're walking through in this season kind of a greatest hits of his teachings and healings. And the story we read from Matthew 9 today is one of those greatest hits. I actually think it's a paradigm for, for all the other healings that happens in the gospel. And, and it's utterly confounding to what we think we know and what we think we want. So we're going to walk through this a piece at a time, starting at verse 1, just to sort of, sort of set the scene. Verse 1 of Matthew chapter 9. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his hometown. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. Okay, now this story is set in Capernaum. Jesus' hometown. He's done healings here before, so now he's coming back into town from some travels, and everybody's ready. Everybody's waiting, including this paralyzed man and his friends. Now, you might have heard this story before in a different version from the Gospels of Mark and Luke. There, they include the detail that the house where Jesus is teaching is so crowded that the only way for these friends to get the paralytic in to see Jesus is to tear apart the roof and to lower him through. You might remember that story. That's the same story. That's the same thing happening here. It's quite a dramatic scene and, and one that reveals something key about the paralytic and his friends. They believe that Jesus can do this. They have faith that he can be healed and Jesus sees that. Verse 2 again, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son. 
Jesus, crowded around by all these people in the midst of this mob, looks up and he sees. I don't mean like physically sees. I mean he sees the realities underneath the reality. I think sometimes we wonder whether in the midst of our sufferings, in the midst of everything that's happening to us, whether God sees, but He does all the way down. Jesus sees this man's condition, sees his complete dependence, sees the bed sore, sees his, his tragic past, whatever caused this, and, and sees a dead-end future ahead of Him. But He also sees the hunger and the hope and the trust that is present in this man and his friends. They're not just a face in the crowd to him. They're not just an inconvenience. They haven't just destroyed his house or whoever's house. They are beloved. They are beloved, and he is touched by their trust, and he says, take heart, son. That's one of those little phrases that doesn't translate well into another language. We might translate it like, be encouraged, friend. Like, don't despair, kid. There's this, there's this tenderness and an intimacy in these words. This is an expression of true and deep care, of true and deep seeing all the way down. And as he says it, we can only imagine what's happening in this man's heart. Jesus, Jesus sees him. Jesus hears him and, and knows him and, and cares about him, which means that healing must be coming because if he cares, why wouldn't he? How couldn't he? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. What the flip? (laughs) What is Jesus talking about? That's not the issue here. This is not one of the bad people in that culture. This is not a tax collector or a prostitute. This is not someone who came with a guilty conscience. Right? Imagine you're going to your doctor for a cancer appointment, and you've got a terminal diagnosis, and you desperately want this experimental treatment, and he opens the door, and he says, oh my goodness, I'm so excited to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Be encouraged, friend. I've got great news. Your sins are forgiven. I'd fire that doctor after I punched them in the face. That's not what he's looking for. That's not what he wants. Your sins are forgiven. Is this cruel? Is this a joke? No, of course, that's what we'd be thinking in this situation because it's what we think in our situations. Right? When God doesn't fix our greatest problems, doesn't fix the things that obviously need to be put back together, doesn't heal the, the places where we're experiencing the most pain, we ask, are you cruel? Do, do you care? And I... Imagine with the eyes of faith, Jesus coming to us and saying, take heart, daughter. Take heart, son. I do. I do see you. I do care. It's simply that he sees more clearly than we do the difference between the disease and the symptoms. To understand Jesus' heart here, you have to hold in your heart the whole scriptural story. You have to go back to Genesis 2, Genesis 3, everything starts to go wrong, right? In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve's relationship with one another breaks, right? Their relationship with creation breaks, their relationship with their bodies break, they're now cursed with physical death, a whole ton of terrible stuff happens, all of it kind of pictures of all the things that happen in our lives, but it all starts from the rupture of their relationship with God. One of the points Genesis is making is that all our other problems, all our other sufferings flow downstream from the problem of a broken relationship with the one who made us, from our relationship with our Creator. Now, it's not that, that, that every suffering is caused by a particular sin. It's not like the paralytic woke up one day, cursed his parents, and suddenly became paralyzed. Jesus says that's not the way it works explicitly in John 9. But breaking that relationship with God in the midst of our human family ends up breaking everything else. Broken relationship with God is the disease. Everything else that's broken is the symptom. Which means that if that relationship with the Father is fixed, 
then everything else can be fixed too. See, this is one of the primary differences between Christianity and most other ways of looking at the world. Most other ways of looking at the world start with the problems that are downstream and say, man, if we could just fix that, we'd have this thing put back together. The problem is, is this is a giant game of whack-a-mole. Right? Fix that, and some other problem pops up. Solve that problem, and nine more are created in its wake. But according to Jesus, our greatest problem, our most fundamental issue is that our relationship with the Father is broken. So that is the place true healing begins. Everything else simply is covering symptoms. Words of forgiveness, words of restoration, words of renewal are actually conquering the disease. That's why the healing of the soul is priority number one for Jesus here. Because if that relationship is restored, everything else is going to follow, right? And I mean that in, in, in reality, in tangible flesh and blood. If this man's sins are forgiven, his body will undoubtedly be healed for eternity when God finally and fully restores all things, right? If the paralytic welcomes this gift, he will welcome eventually the inevitable, unstoppable, unbreakable gift of a resurrected body in the age to come. See, imagine it were the other way around. If Jesus only heals his body and not his soul, if he heals the downstream ailment, everything he fixes is only going to be temporary. Anything he mends is only going to come unwound again. It's only going to slow the disease and not eradicate it. So he starts here. He heals the soul instead of the body in order to more fully heal the body. Everything about this man as that healing rolls downhill. Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Which causes the crowd to go nuts. Not for the same reasons we would go nuts. We would say, how dare you, because he hasn't gone far enough. They say, how dare you, because they think he's gone too far. Verse 3. At this some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Now, to say you can forgive sins, that's something only God can do. At least from from God's vantage point, the ultimate forgiveness of sins. Because sin is an offense not just against another person, but against God. Because sin is not just doing bad things, not just making poor choices. Sin is the rejection of the one who made us, so only God can ultimately forgive that offense. For Jesus to say that he is forgiving this man's sin without a sacrifice, without atonement, without substitution, as even the Old Testament required, that is tantamount to blasphemy. Unless, of course, there's an atoning sacrifice coming, which there is, and unless he's actually God himself, united to a human nature, which he is, but they don't know that. And they don't trust that it's even conceivable. Verse 4, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain such evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin." Now, these words often get misunderstood. Jesus is not asking which is easier to do, to forgive sins or heal a person. He is asking which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. Now, obviously, it's easier to say someone is forgiven because you can't prove that it happened. Right? We say it every week in the absolution. You could easily just wave it away. But if he says, get up and walk, there's evidence one way or the other. There's, there's sort of a public accountability to this. So Jesus says the harder thing, not to prove that he can heal the body. He knows he can heal the body. He's already healed bodies. Other people have seen him heal bodies or he wouldn't be coming here. He says this not to prove that he can body, but to prove that he can heal the soul. 
The physical healing is this sign pointing to the fact that he can heal all of it, that he can heal bodies in order to bring healing to souls, to bring them back into right relationship with their creator. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. I love that. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. This is the paradigm. Jesus is healing all things. He heals our souls so that our bodies, our whole selves might be put back together in that last day when we are raised from the tombs. He heals our bodies so that we may know that he has the power to heal all of it, including our souls. This is what happens when in our weakness. Jesus sees us, Jesus cares, and healing comes. just not always in the order or in the way we were expecting or even wanting. Friends, we need need to say this as clearly as possible. In Jesus, there is power to heal. In Jesus, there is power to heal. There is power to heal the body and power to heal the soul. There is power to mend tumors and traumas and guilt and shame. There is power to mend relationships with loved ones and power to mend the relationship with the one who loves us most of all. There is power to heal society. There is power to heal systems. There is power to make all the sad things come untrue. There is power for all of it. And he tells us to ask for it. He tells us to cry out for it. So that's what we do. We cry out for it. We beg for it for ourselves and others, keeping the whole story at the center of our hearts, keeping the whole gospel in the center of these prayers. We ask for healing, knowing that Christ can heal souls to fully heal bodies, and that he heals bodies in order to heal souls. We ask with the grain of his desires. So we ask first and primarily for the healing of our souls, for the healing of our relationship with him. Because if that gets healed, the healing of everything else, again, it's inevitable. Everything else rolls downhill from that. If we miss that healing, anything good that happens to us will be temporary. But we also ask for physical healing. Because that physical healing, that relational healing, that psychological healing, all the different aspects of that, that is God's desire. That is what he desires for us. That's what he's going to make true for us. And when it comes in the here and now, it often serves as a sign that God can and will heal our souls too. It serves as a sign to our doubting spirits, the ones that aren't quite sure. It serves as a sign to the the watching world that is skeptical that God can and that he does restore all things, that it's only his name in heaven and earth by which we can be saved what Peter preached in Acts 4, and it's what we still preach today. Now, if you think, man, we might be making a little bit too much out of this one passage, let's look at that word saved for a second. Only name in heaven and earth by which we must be saved. In the New Testament, the word saved is used for spiritual and physical salvation being saved from physical death and spiritual death. The biblical writers didn't have one word for physical rescue and another word for spiritual rescue. They used the same word for both. Because ultimately, salvation is both. It's a saving of all of it. Okay, let's go back uh, to the New Testament passage we read today from the book of James, right? We're going to read it again slowly. Listen to how James interweaves physical and spiritual healing in these verses. James 5, starting at verse 14. says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. 
Okay, straightforward enough. Someone's physically ill. Let's have the church and her representatives lay hands on them with oil, a sign of the Spirit's presence. Call on the name of Jesus. In other words, uh, make clear that the power for this isn't in us, it's in Jesus, and ask for Jesus to do something. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Now, we've all known situations where we've prayed for someone and they didn't get well. What happened? Well, literally, literally it says in the text that this prayer offered in faith will save them. That could be physical. That could be spiritual. Next phrase, the Lord will raise them up. The word for raise them up could mean getting out of bed or it could mean being raised from the dead to eternal life. It's the same word. Next phrase, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Oh, okay, now we're in spiritual healing world. Got it, unambiguous. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, wait a minute. Is James talking about physical or spiritual healing? Yes. So which one is going to happen when we pray? Who knows? But here's what we do know. James says that the healing of the Lord will break in. In other words, nothing doesn't happen when we pray. I'll give you a second to catch up to that phrase. (laughs) Right? Parse those double negatives. Nothing doesn't happen when we pray. If he brings the healing of the body, hallelujah, it's a sign that he's going to heal the soul. If it's the healing of the soul, that means our healing of our bodies is inevitable and it might even come now, so let's keep asking. We beg for the healing of souls so that bodies may be healed and the healing of bodies so that souls may be healed. This is not some crazy thing that those people over there do or we only do some of the time. This is the ordinary, extraordinary work of the church and the spirit of God within her. Now, some of you are about ready to jump out of your seats and start a prayer meeting right here. (laughs) Just give us a few minutes. We're getting there. But some of you right now are freaking out. Because you're like, man, I did not think this was that kind of church. (laughs) Because you think, I don't think I'm that kind of person. That's not me. That's not what I do. That's not something I've ever had experience with. But friends, you may not have, but we have. We, as the body of Christ gathered together, have seen this and we can walk in it together. We've prayed over Rwandan friends and had them healed directly, physically, when there was no medical hope. We've prayed over people here in the prayer time at Eucharist and between services, and we have seen people's hope healed, their sins forgiven, their assurance healed, seen people go to the doctor that week and suddenly after months and months and months of futility, the doctor know what's wrong and exactly how to treat it. We are already doing this, and you are a part of it. And it's not like we have to have some magic words. You don't have to pray just the right words in the right order. All that is asked for on our side is faith, is trust. And that's where a lot of the misunderstandings come in. We've gotten so wrapped around the axle on faith and what it means in this context. One misunderstanding is that faith is something we have to stir up, that we have to achieve, that we have to have in order to kind of like meet God so he'll pay attention to us. But even faith, Ephesians 2 says, is his gift to us. It is something he gives. If we're willing to ask, there is faith already present for this. But then we can start to wonder, man, do I, like, uh, do I have enough faith? Is my faith strong enough for that? Friends, it says in Matthew 17 that we have, if we have faith even as a mustard seed, even as a, as a pine nut, Eugene Peterson says, to put it into an American lingo, we can move mountains. Because it's not the amount of faith that matters. It is the power of the one we're putting our faith in that matters. 
If we ask, we know that he's going to hear us and that he's going to give us good things. We don't know what good things he's going to give us, but we know that we can claim that generosity and we can explore it. We can ask for what does God want to do in this situation. We can trust that as we're on our knees asking for healing, we're not going to do any harm. He's not going to like give us a bad thing. We can trust that he hears us, that he knows what's best for us right now, and that he's going to give us good gifts. See, there's this lie that the strongest faith is the kind of faith that says God's going to heal, must heal in this particular way. That's actually lesser faith, friends, because it puts a demand on God to do what we think is best. Faith that isn't open to the possibility that we might be wrong isn't faith. It's a hostage situation. It's an attempt to hold God hostage to what we want, to what we think. It is greater faith to trust that he can heal in all these ways and to leave the choice in his hands, to trust that he knows best and to be expectant that healing is going to come. Now, we need help in learning how to pray this way. So this week, we've included on the back of your bulletin, if you turn to the back, um, we've included on the back of your bulletin a prayer for healing, actually from the healing service, from the Book of Common Prayer. It's sometimes called the BCP, the Anglican Book of Worship. Now, now many have called the BCP the Bible rearranged for prayer. And you'll see that all the things that we're talking about from the scriptures, from the Bible, from the book of James, from here in Matthew 9, are in this prayer. It's, it's not a magical incantation. It's a guide to praying with the grain of what Jesus himself desires. I want to ask us all right now together, let's just pray this together and then we're going to unpack it a little bit. Lord Jesus Christ, heal this your servant. Sustain them with your presence. Drive away all sickness of body, mind, and spirit. And give to them that victory of life and peace, which will enable them to serve you both now and forevermore. This isn't a replacement for our prayers. It's like training wheels for our prayers. It's guidance for our prayers. Because do you see the breadth of healing that's being asked for? Do you see that? The breadth of that faith, faith that he can heal body, mind, and spirit, faith that he can bring outer life and that inner peace, faith that his presence can sustain us in the midst of our sufferings that don't go away, and faith that he will bring us into his presence fully forevermore. There's, a, there's an eternal perspective here. I don't usually do this, but I want to encourage each and every one of us in this room to memorize this prayer this week so that you can have it on the tip of your tongue, so you can be ready to riff off of it at any moment, so it can be available to you when you're in a situation where, man, this needs Jesus' healing. It's not gonna magically call God down, but it's prayers like these that can shape our hearts into a deeper hope, into a deeper faith to receive whatever he's got for us, even and especially if what he's got for us is not what we want. Because we can trust that he is good and that healing is coming and is already here. Now for these next few minutes, we always have a time of sermon reflection, but today I want to do something a little different. I want to have in this next time a a prayer meeting of sorts. If you want to sit in the pew and pray this kind of prayer for yourself and others, if you just need that set-apart space to to ask for Jesus to meet you in these places, man, you are welcome to. What power there is in that, all of us praying together in the same direction. But if you sense this morning that you need prayer for healing, physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever it is, that you need prayer for healing and you want others to come around you and pray for you, Yeah, you you can come to the prayer ministers at Eucharist, you can come to the prayer ministers after the service, but also I want to invite you right now that you can stand up where you are and go to an aisle, one of the side aisles or the center aisle. And we're going to have prayer ministers who are going to come to you and pray for you and with you. And if you're somebody sitting in a pew and you're like, man, nobody's going to pray with that person, go! 
Let's pray for one another. Let's bless one another. Let's come around one another with the grain of the gospel and pray in expectancy that Jesus is here and that he hears us and that he is still about this work of healing. Souls, bodies, relationships, minds, all of it. Jesus, Right now, would you pour into our hearts faith by your Holy Spirit? There is such an abundance of your generosity, and we so often assume that we're left with crumbs. Come, Holy Spirit, pour faith into our hearts, faith that you are alive, faith that you are working, faith that you love us more than we can fathom, that you are for us, that you are working even when we can't see it and we can't feel it. You are making all things new. And we trust you to start that wherever you want to start that, with us.